Hi, my name is Brian Latimer. We're here for In Conversation, a collaboration with NBC News Think and NBC Out. We're here talking with Guy Vandenberg, one of the nurses who is featured in the new documentary 5B, which follows the story of the nurses who started the first HIV AIDS ward in the country in the beginning of the HIV AIDS crisis, before there was even the name HIV AIDS, when it was called gay cancer. The only thing they really knew about this disease was the fact that it was almost 100% fatal. I can't thank you enough for coming to talk to us today, Guy. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Brian. What was it like hearing about the disease at first? So I had, um, I had friends, <clears throat> friends here in New York um, who were getting sick. I lived in uh, Pennsylvania for a bit, um, then moved to New York. And then um, actually the, the first people were people I knew, colleagues, friends that um, had been injection drug users in, in the past. So my entry was more through the action, injection drug use um, population than, than through the gay community, even though I'm a gay man. Um, and um, yeah, it, was, it, it touched me personally. It affected you know, people I knew and that's how um, I, I, I realized that there was very little going on uh, to help folks and I had a friend in San Francisco who was a physician there at the outpatient clinic where I now work who said we have this model of care with the Shanti project and meals delivered to people's home this kind of comprehensive approach and the Shanti project was there which is volunteers trained in end-of-life uh, support and counseling why don't you come take a look and so I packed up my stuff and actually moved to San Francisco with the idea that I'm just going to see what, how they do stuff here and then I'll either go back to the East Coast or maybe even to Europe, I don't know yet. And I fell in love with San Francisco and with the model of care that existed there and I wanted to be part of that. So this was at San Francisco General. You were in your nursing program when you were working in the ward. How would you work with somebody as they came in, with somebody who was sick? What would be the first thing that you do to make them feel more comfortable? Um, ask about them, you know, and not just, how's your cough? Um, are you hurting anywhere? Those are important questions, of course, but, um, but I would ask them, you know, what, what, what do you like to do? Do you have pets, do you know? What, what, is, what do you enjoy in life? And just, or what, whatever they wanted to talk about, really, or, uh, whether it was a particular anxiety or something they liked, just get to know the person. And then while also, you know, doing what was necessary, you know, start an IV or, you know, you had to do, of course, those kinds of things, but it, it's important to make people feel like they're more than a sick person. They're a human yeah. being. And you, there, there's somebody who needs treatment, but somebody who at this time really also needs radical compassion at a time when nobody would really touch them, hold their hand, embrace them. Do you remember the, the first patient that you, you touched in this ward? On the ward? Yeah. Yes, I do. I do. And this particular person was anxious um, and wanted to smoke and couldn't because it was on oxygen and, and you couldn't smoke in a hospital anyway, but um, it's anxious. and and kept talking about wanting to smoke. And then when we held hands, I said, you know, I just, I know this is rough. There was, there was that, that relaxation. You know, like, okay, I can actually, I can hold off on a cigarette, you know. I can just be, be here. And you're taking care of patients, but you're also working with other nurses who are working with people and easing them to their deaths. How did you take care of each other? Um, in a very practical way, we would, we would often, um, in, if something had to be done, we would team up and, you know, turn somebody together or, or do stuff together. Um, which wasn't, you know, if I floated to a different ward, you had your patients and you were going to take care of them. Um, when we were on 5A, we would often go in together if we, uh, if we had the possibility to do so. So in that very practical sense, we supported each other. And then, you know, as you see in the film, um, when, when good stuff or bad stuff happens, you, 
you want to share it with each other. And in the film, at one point, you see Franzi, who was on the night shift, um, receiving the news that this particular patient had died. And he, um, he hugs the other nurse and says, oh, shit, or whatever he says. I forget what he says. But it's that, you know, we, we touched each other a lot, too. I vividly remember that scene, you know, one nurse rubbing the other one's back, you know, the same hands that are holding the hands of these sick patients. It's incredibly moving. And, you know, we're talking 30 years after this epidemic, 35 years after yeah. this epidemic, but we're also 50 years since Stonewall. Yeah. What do you remember from the Stonewall time? During, you know, when Stonewall happened, I was seven years old and in, in, uh, in the Netherlands still. But I do remember that it was a riot, and uh, it was a riot. It's important that people remember that. It was a riot. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a joyful event, uh, even though we celebrate it now. It wasn't a joyful event. It was a necessary event, but it was a riot, and people got hurt. Um, so I do remember that, and my parents were involved in the anti-war movement. They were, you know, I guess you could consider hippies. And so they were interested. So I learned that, you know, there were people that were treated poorly because of who they were. And my parents narrowly survived the Second World War, the occupation of the Netherlands by a fascist regime. And so they, they knew what it was like when society marginalizes people, shuns them, and treats them as, as less than human. And we're hearing it now with immigrants. And in, in the beginning of the epidemic, it was, it was gay people, people, commercial sex workers, uh, injection drug users, Haitians, and even, you know, kids who uh, had hemophilia. It's very easy to forget that that can happen anytime. Yeah, and it was, it, was, it was children who were driven out of school districts, and the documentary shows one house that was firebombed in that process. There was just fear, and there was a need to make it go away by any means, that means necessary. Absolutely. I think that there is a huge focus on the film on the medical professionals, because we tend to hear about the activists, like people with ACT UP and the people who organized and made the story of HIV AIDS as public as possible. But you got to work before you really knew anything about the disease. How did you come to the decision to work with HIV AIDS patients before you knew it was how it was transferred? I think because it was there, you do what is in front of you. You know, you you do you do what's necessary, and and so that was never a question for me really. You know, imagine that as we're sitting here, you Brian and I, we're sitting here. A two-year-old walks in, shuffles in, and and says, can I have some water? What do you do? You give the kid water. That's what you do. That's, it's a primal human thing. You don't ask this kid, you know, where are you from? Do you have papers? Who are your parents? Uh, what gender are they? And you, you don't. You, you, you do what's necessary. And, and, and it, this is no different, I feel. I do want to ask you about how it took six, almost seven years for the President of the United States at the time to even acknowledge the crisis publicly. 1987, Ronald Reagan actually spoke of the crisis. And you even had visitors from his HIV AIDS commission who came to Ward 5B. I want to, one, ask you, what was it like hearing the President say it for the first time, but two, also meeting people from this commission? Um. Yeah, as, as Hank, the, the, the local, our, our, I have to say, our local news anchor that we l loved, um, said when, at the time that Reagan said, first uttered the word AIDS, um, Hank made a note in his reporter's notebook that at that time, um, 21,000 citizens, Americans, human beings had already died. So I was, I had these mixed feelings, like he said the word. And now it's, there is some awareness somewhere in the government that this exists. Um, and anger, like what would it have taken six years if it had been Girl Scouts or, you know, that got affected? 
right before HIV, we had Legionnaire's disease. There was an all-out effort to find out what that was and what, how to treat it. No expense or effort was spared to get to the bottom of it and make sure that it never happened again. And then, and then HIV, six years, 21,000 deaths before the president would say anything. So yeah, we welcomed, we welcomed any kind of publicity, any kind of publicity. And we tried to manipulate it, as, as Hank so clearly states in the film, to, to raise awareness and to tell the real story um, and, and make sure that people knew that this was not about others, that this virus doesn't discriminate. I do want to go more current events with this yeah. right now. President Trump has made an initiative to take on HIV AIDS globally. He wants to eradicate it. How do you think that compares to Ronald Reagan's efforts? And two, do you think what he wants to do is enough? You know, he, he has said many things. And he has also gone back in many instances. I remember when he ran, um, he had some kind of the gays love me moment. Um, and of course, I knew that that wasn't genuine. Uh, I don't know why anybody fell for that. Um, I feel, you know, the, when it suits his needs, he will say that there's going to be funding to eradicate HIV. But I don't know how, that that is a genuine commitment. Um, and he says that at the same time that a, a law is about to be passed that allows healthcare workers to deny care to to patients based on the healthcare worker's religious conviction. It's, that's incompatible, that it, it, those, it doesn't go together. And it's, it's un-American, it's, it's inhuman, it's against the nurse's oath of et ethics. He also says this stuff about, you know, helping people with HIV at the same moment that we have kids in cages. Um, and the first of this month, June, a transgender woman, a nurse, um, Johanna Medina from El Salvador was in ICE custody H and sick with an HIV related illness and was denied care and now they try to walk it back and say that she didn't die in ICE custody but she died in a hospital she was already dying and ICE brought her to the hospital so they could say she died in the hospital but that is what our government is, is really doing at this, at this point. My patients at San Francisco General Hospital who are undocumented have fear about coming to the clinic. They know, we've told them, that we will never cooperate with ICE or any other government agency, that they are safe to come for their HIV care to our clinic. But when you see this stuff on TV all the time and you know that people have been taken from their workplace or their home um, and either been deported or, or are held in ICE custody, it makes, you, it makes you fearful. I understand why they're not coming to clinic. And they, if they don't come to clinic long enough, they run out of medication and they will get sick. It's unnecessary. We have everything we need to, to, to eliminate this epidemic. We have PrEP. We have effective treatment. If your, your viral load is undetectable, you can't transmit the virus. We have everything we need, but how are we going to make access to everybody possible? I'm glad you bring up PrEP because that was going to be my next question. I do want to take a quick moment to just say, for those of you who don't know, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's a daily pill that you can take to lower your chances almost to 99.9% .9 effectively avoid contracting HIV and contracting the virus. You know, Gilead says that they're going to make the generic available by 2020. But I do want to ask you if you think that that's enough. No, it's not. You know, good for Gilead that they, you know, they've, they've allowed other countries to produce their drugs um, off patent. It's still in our country way more expensive than it is in other countries. And the, the new version of PrEP is this Covey which is going to be much more expensive than the Truvada that is currently being used and has fewer kidney and bone side effects. So basically, you're, 
telling us, Gilead, take our expensive drug and you're going to you know, have PrEP without the possible kidney uh, and bone side effects, or use Truvada, which is cheaper, and risk having those kinds of side effects. So, no, it's not enough. It's, this company makes a tremendous amount of profit. And uh, I think they have a social responsibility. Companies in this system that we have will do everything they can to maximize their profit and will only be uh, accountable when they're held accountable by the public. So we need, we need ACT UP today. And not just actually for HIV, we need it for other uh, disease states as well. Um, drug companies are, you know, some of the highest yield profit companies uh, that, that we have in our country. And they have an undue amount of influence uh, in politics. They have, they have a very strong lobby. There's one thing I do want to ask you. Um, during the epidemic, it came into your home. The disease came into your home. You know, you had it at work. You're around it all the time. Your getaway, your sanctuary, all of a sudden it was there. Can you tell me about that, please? Brian, that, it, that is so well put. That is so well put, and that is exactly how I felt it. I was dealing with uh, HIV. I was fighting for better access to medications in my free time. Uh, I was in ACT UP, and during work I was dealing with the devastating effects of the disease. And uh, I somehow felt that I, I had gained a right to not have it come that close, which is, of course, fiction. That, that it doesn't work that way. But it's a hope, it's a dream at that point, because that's all you it can is. really have sometimes. Yeah. So when, yeah, when Steve got sick um, and was diagnosed, I, I was angry. I was uh, terrified. This man is the love of my life. So it was really that was really hard, and um, and I knew that that uh, I could call. I literally called when Steve couldn't get out of bed because he couldn't feel his legs. I called Dion at 5 a, and and, I, and said, you know, what do I do? And she said, bring him to the emergency department. I'll meet you guys there. And uh, within uh, next hour or so, he was on 5 a, and they. Um, they scanned him, did a biopsy, and took a, what they thought was a meningioma out of his spine. And we were afraid it was a, a horrible cancer. And then it turned out to be a TB-related uh, tuberculoma, they call it, and compressing his spinal cord. And we were like, oh, we can treat TB. We, we know how to do that. And, 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 and it was just after we had, uh, uh, had access, gained access to combination antiretroviral therapy, what was then known as the cocktail. And so we're like, good, you know, we've treated the TB, now we'll treat the HIV. And we did, and then his immune system kind of woke up, got stronger, and recognized that there was some TB in, in the body and attacked it, which created inflammation. Inflammation causes swelling. And so Steve's brain started swelling, and he was in a coma for three months. And so they, the team said, uh, he's been comatose for so long now, and they did a brain biopsy, and they found this, this swelling and inflammation. They said, you know, he's not going to, he may, he may come through this, but he's not going to be able to function. Why don't you maybe withdraw care and make him comfortable at hospice or at home with home hospice? And I wasn't ready to, to, to give up. And luckily, neither was his mom and his, uh, his brother and father and, and, uh, and his doctor. And his doctor said, this could be inflammation and why don't we try steroids? Throw the kitchen sink at it, continue his HIV meds and add some steroids and treat the opportuni opportunistic infections. And within three days, he started you know, opening his eyes, looking around. Nobody expected that he would make as full a recovery as he has, except maybe his doctor and his mom and I, which was a mixture of hope and, um, and knowing Steve. He's a fighter. And so uh, he did. He learned to walk again. He learned to talk again. 
and now when you see him you would never know you would never know but that wasn't that wasn't guaranteed at the time so it's one of the many hopeful things that you can take away from this film you know the many hopeful things there are many as you you, you saw it and um, it's more of a Kleenex type of movie than, uh, it than a popcorn. It absolutely is. And honest, that, that moment you described him waking up and then he's speaking, I burst into tears because it was any sort of joy that I was just fiending for at that moment and needing because it was such a hard documentary to watch but so necessary at this time. Guy, I can't thank you enough again for coming to talk to us. I'm Brian Latimer with NBC News Think and NBC Out, and this was In Conversation about the new documentary 5B. Thank you. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.